Roswell Flight Test Crew here at AMA 2016. Be sure to click subscribe to keep up with our updates from the show. And I'm here speaking to Rich Hansen, who's the Government and Regulatory Affairs Director for the AMA. How are you, sir? Very good, Patrick. Thank Very you. Very good. Thank you for having us. The AMA originally asked its 180,000 members to hold off on moving ahead with their federal registration until February 19th, which was the very last day to register. What's your uh, position now, and why did you have that delay built in? Well, the reason we asked and suggested that our members hold off on, on registering was that we've been working with the FAA on a more streamlined process of of recognizing your AMA membership as being your federal registration. We actually approached the FAA on that going back when we were working with them on the original uh, registration task force. And we have been working with them ever since so that basically AMA members already already register to in a fashion by joining the AMA. They give us their name, their address, their email address. We interact with them on a regular basis, on safety basis. Our safety program directs them to put their AMA number or their name and address on or within their aircraft. So that literally ties them to the aircraft and, and effectively accomplishes the objectives of the federal registration program. So our hope was that we would develop a program that would allow our members to basically seamlessly become registered. We worked with the FAA, we were asking our members to hold off so that we could get this accomplished and do this all in one fell swoop. Unfortunately, just a couple of days ago, both our IT department and the FAA IT department came back and said, we, we just aren't gonna be able to do that in the timeline allotted. So the idea of holding off, unfortunately, is not gonna accomplish what we were hoping to accomplish, and certainly the requirement to register is still in effect. It became effective December 21st, and you have until February 19th to accomplish that for your existing aircraft. So we certainly would expect all of our members to follow regulation and law and be in compliance. And if they register before the 20th of January, they, they get the $5 fee rebated back to them on their credit card. So if we're going to do it, we might as well do it in the next 10 days or so. That's correct. And the registration uh, system that they put forward did allow a 60-day grace period, but gave you 30 days to register for free. So that 30-day window will expire on January 20th. Now, uh, going back to the registration, um, are you, is that something you're still working on? You hope that we'll achieve in the future so one day our AMA memberships will be our federal registration? Yes, that, that uh, effort is still moving forward, and the FAA um, is certainly receptive to that process, and they have told us that they're going to continue working with us on trying to make that happen. Unfortunately, it is going to take longer than we had hoped. It may be several months before all of the IT pieces are put together to make that happen. But once it does, basically by being a member of the AMA in good standing, you will have registered with the federal government and you will be able to use your AMA number as you have in the past as your registration ID. And eventually we're hoping that actually your AMA card will be your proof of registration. There's still some issues there that have to be addressed and some ways um, maybe we'll need to modify the card so that uh, becomes more um, obvious in terms of what's intended there, but that's our hope and that's our vision for doing it. So as AMA members have in the past, you join the AMA, you pay your dues, you, you become fairly registered and you still have fun flying model airplanes. I know a lot of people would be much more comfortable doing business that way, so sure. yeah. Now uh, I understand that you've been continuing to work with the uh, FAA on some of these issues which have been very troubling to, to model flyers and those of us in the drone community, like the um, the 400 foot limit. There's been a lot of questions, is that like a hard limit? And I know a lot of acrobatic guys, a lot of sailplane guys routinely go well above 400 feet and they do so safely, but there's a lot of concern that this 400 foot limit is somehow you know a hard and fast rule and you're, you're aiming to get some flexibility from the FAA on that. For example, how's that going? I think it's important to remember that um, we have always had a 400-foot guideline going back to 1981 with the original advisory circular where FAA said that model aircraft should stay below 400 feet. And we have incorporated those guidelines into our safety program to um, allow for the modeling operations that we do on a daily basis to be done safely and to recognize the need for staying below get that particular altitude in areas where we have the biggest risk for Countering, countering manned aircraft. And that's basically when we're getting close to airports. That's where manned aircraft converge and come down to lower altitudes. So the AMA safety code says that you stay below four feet when you're within three miles of an airport. 
That three miles mirrors what was in the old advisory circular in 1981. Now, we're also hearing the 400-foot guideline in reference to UAS and what people are calling drones. And 400 feet is a good oh, yeah. safety principle that these types of devices really are safer down at these lower altitudes, knowing that most manned aircraft are above those altitudes. But there are modeling activities that necessarily take us above 400 feet, and there are activities where it's actually safer to do it at 400 feet. So the real rule for AMA members is that you follow um, the requirements that come out in the Special Rule for Model Aircraft in Section 336 and the safety guidelines within AMA safety program, which allows for operations above 400 feet if it's done safely and responsibly and according to our rules. Yeah, good to know, because I know it's something that a lot of people are anxious about. And um, speaking of anxious about things, let me ask you, you were a member of the task force, the task force on drone you know, mm -hmm. UAS registration. Uh, can you sort of give us a little sort of inside scoop of what it was like to be in that room and how that process worked out and just, just dish, Rich, dish. Well, sure. <laughs> I mean, again, remembering that this was close to an edict that came down from um, the executive branch, it, it certainly was as high up as the Secretary of Transportation, Secretary Fox. In October, he announced their intentions of creating a registration system for the recreational use of unmanned aircraft. Um, they also formed a task force of industry and stakeholder representatives to come together and make recommendations on those um, requirements and the registration process. So we were one of close to 30 people that represented various aspects of the industry. We were just one seat there that represented our 185,000 modelers, but there are also seats there that represent the man community in the form of the Air Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, the Helicopter Association International, the Airline Pilots Association, the Association of Airport Executives, I mean, there, there was a large representation from the man community. There was also representation there from the UAS industry, people like DGI, 3D Robotics, Best Buy as retailer, Amazon as retailer. So there was a lot of voices here and a lot of views and a lot of opinions. And the intent of the task force was tried to come to at least a general agreement, if not consensus, on a set of recommendations going forward. And we were on record as saying back in October when Secretary Fox made his announcement that we believe that registration does make sense at some level. And to us, it starts making sense when you start talking about a device that has the capability to self-navigate. And self-navigate gives it the ability to either intentionally or inadvertently fly some distance away from the pilot. So we were really hoping that we'd be looking at a threshold for registration that targeted that capability. Unfortunately, from our perspective, the task force went in a more simplistic approach and said, well, let's just make it very simple and we'll just make it weight oriented. And that was sort of the first decision that was made. And then when they selected the weight, they started looking at lethality. There's a study that's been around for a while that talks about how much energy constitutes a lethal blow if something falls from the sky. And that initial study was looking in the area of somewhere around 150 to 200 grams which would create enough what they call joules, the amount of energy, to, to be lethal. The task force said, through somewhat of a negotiation, a give and take, um, they selected the threshold of 250 grams, which is just a little over half a pound. I think it's 8.8 .8 ounces, something like that. We really were concerned that that was a little too low. Actually, we think it's significantly low. We um, looked at our park pilot program that's been around since 2008, yeah that identified the very small, lightweight, microelectronic RC aircraft, and we set that threshold at two pounds, which, or you could say that would have been about one kilogram. And we know from millions of flights since 2008 and even before that there's never been a significant injury, let alone fatality, involving one of these aircraft. So although an object falling from the sky from 400 feet has the lethal potential when you start looking at probability of it actually hitting and killing somebody, the experience that we have in our community is that extremely low probability. Yeah. We're concerned that we're actually looking at things that, that have basically toys. Yeah. They have very little capability. They have a very short lifespan. A lot of these things that were given as gifts over the holiday now have, have either 
been broken or have been discarded or they've lost interest in them and they're now drawing dust on a shelf someplace. That really was something that we voiced in the task force but when you look at the task force operations you know we were we were not able to convince others to go in that fashion. They really felt strongly that we, since there was some lethal potential there, that they should be registered. Well, thank you for letting us know, because I know that the people have been very curious to know what that negotiation was like, so thank sure. you. You and, know, if I can follow on yeah. to that, um, another aspect of it that we felt strongly about was the AMA community, by its nature, registers its members. When a member joins the AMA, they give us their name, their address, their email address. We interact with them at least once a year for renewal purposes. We actually interact with them on a monthly basis through our communications, constantly distributing safety material to them. They have the ability to relay safety issues to us. By our safety program, they're asked to put their AMA number or their name and address on or within their aircraft. So if the aircraft gets away from the operator, it can be identified as to its ownership and who's responsible for it. So we believe strongly that AMA members effectively meet the objectives of registration. Mm -hmm. And we've asked through the task force process that we be given some dispensation for that and either be exempt from the process or that our membership process be viewed as an alternative means of compliance or as a minimum that we use the membership process as a way of getting those people registered. That didn't come out in regulation, but it is something we're still working with the FAA to accomplish. So let's hope that process comes together. Sure. Now, another issue which I know is can be a hot button issue within the aero modeling community is the question of FPV and UAS or drones or however you want to call it. Could you please just sort of restate what is the AMA's position on this new technology? FPV and drones, as people are calling drones, or what the FAA more technically calls unmanned aircraft systems, UAS, um, yes. th those are really two different issues, and, and really the safety considerations for both those are different. You know, let's take FPV, for instance, as a, as a separate modeling or, or hobby activity where people are mounting cameras on the aircraft and using the video downlink and either a set of goggles or a LCD screen to virtually fly the aircraft through a cockpit view. This potentially gives the operator the capability of going beyond visual line of sight, but doesn't necessarily they intend to do that. We certainly welcome that technology. It's another aspect of flying model aircraft. I've done it myself. I mean, it's not actually brand new technology. I did it back in the 90s. Oh, yeah. uh, and it's a challenging, fun way to fly. But you still are required, uh, now by law, to keep that aircraft within visual line of sight. And you also have to have the ability to see the airspace around it and see and avoid any other aircraft or objects that you might run into. So AMA has developed and did this back in 2008, or maybe it was 2010, we developed a safety guideline for FPV. In document 550, if yeah, I remember. Absolutely. That allows you to fly FPV as long as you keep it within vision and line of sight and you still have that ability to see and avoid other aircraft. I understand, and this is, I'm terribly upset at the thought of it, that there's been some change in your role at the AMA. Can you please uh, let people know what's happening there? Obviously, the government relations activity within the AMA has grown exponentially over the last, especially the last three years. And I've been fulfilling this role since 2008 when, at that time, we were working with the FAA on the original recommendations for the small UAS rule. And we thought that that would be a part-time effort uh, for two or three years. That has actually turned into a very full-time, 24-7 effort. <laughs> and especially over the last three years, we, need, we know we need more resources to do that. Plus, uh, you know, looking at years to come, we need to transition to that people that are going to grow into those positions. So what we've done is, one, we've expanded the, the government relations department. We added a young man named uh, Chad Boudreaux, who came over from our um, publications and media department, a very bright young man, very articulate. He has a degree in political science, so he's, he's very attuned to this arena that we're working into. And we're now mentoring him into a leadership role within government relations. In order to do that, I have actually stepped down from an employee role and am now working in an contra outside contractor role. I'm still taking the lead on working with people like the FAA, uh, a lot of the announcements and the interaction with the media and other government entities. But eventually we see Chad being groomed and, and working into that position, and someday I'd like to retire. <laughs> 
Well, I was going to say, I have met Chad on a couple of occasions. I've had the occasion to speak with him more than once, and he does seem like a very sharp guy. So I have, I have no doubt he will serve the organization ably, but you're not allowed to leave. <laughs> just, just so we've got that on record. You're not allowed to retire. I'm sorry. You did too good a job for us. So. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. I need to talk to my wife, though. Oh, okay. That's fair enough. I've met her, too. She seems like a reasonable woman. I'm, I'm sure she'll understand this is very important. <laughs> all right, Rich, well, thank you so much for all of your time you spent with Patrick, us today. thank you, and, and thank you again for all the hard work that you and Brian do. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. And from AMA 2016, this is the Roswell Flight Desk Crew signing off. Thanks again, Rich. You bet.